Hey guys, so tonight we're going to talk about this versus that for GI disorders. So this is going to break down and kind of compare and contrast some GI disorders that are very similar that you might be kind of getting stuck and being like, well, what's the difference here? Keep in mind with some of them, there's like really no difference between them. And so if there's really no difference between them, there's something we can't put on a test and be like, which one is it? Um, you know, but it's more just about um, understanding like those little subtle differences, and especially the treatment, like nursing interventions and teaching that I need to do for these differences. So let's talk about Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. So Crohn's and ulcerative colitis are different in what part of the bowel it affects. So Crohn's affects all layers of the bowel. So you know, your bowel has like multiple layers, like stacked layers, like there's an in, inner layer, an outer layer, and there's a middle layer. Um, and so Crohn's can actually um, cause inflammation on any part of that. It can be on the inside, it can be on the outside, it can be in the middle. Um, so it's definitely can cause a lot more damage. It also can affect any part of the bowel. So it can go more in the small intestines where a lot of the absorption is happening, um, or it can even be all the way through the colon. It can be it, like, kind of like called like patchy. It's kind of like all over the place. Whereas ulcerative colitis is just the innermost layer of your bowel and it just affects the colon and it's continuous inflammation. Whereas Crohn's is that can it patchy kind of all over the place. Um, you know, Crohn's, I'm really going to be most worried about malnutrition because they have the bowel is broken down in areas where you're supposed to be absorbing your nutrients, where ulcerative colitis, um, it's going to be more uh, like more frequent stools. And usually they have up to eight to 10 stools a day. Um, they can have bleeding with those stools because that irritation in the colon can commonly cause bleeding because it's a very vascular area. Um, and so um, they can have more fluid and electrolyte balances. I'm worried about hemodynamic stability if they're bleeding all the time from their stool. And we give medications mostly topically in the colon because that's what's going to be most effective. Where with Crohn's, we have to take a different approach just because like there's there's inflammation all over the place. Like an ulcerative colitis, there's this one continuous inflammation in the colon. Um, it's a lot easier to like target and treat, but again, can also have a lot of complications. So really when you're thinking about Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis, a lot of the same treatments, diet, teaching and stuff like that. But the medications that we're giving, the approach that we're taking is a little bit different. And then those priorities are a little bit different. Crohn's, it's not that um, people with Crohn's can bleed as well, but it's not as common as it is with ulcerative colitis. People with Crohn's can definitely have fluid and electrolyte imbalances because some of those symptoms can lead them to um, not really want to eat. But, um, you know, as a whole, when you're thinking Crohn's, try to think malnutrition, ulcerative colitis, think bleeding, hemodynamic instability, um, and a lot of those kind of problems, those um, fluid and electrolyte imbalances because of the bleeding. Now let's talk about GERD versus hiatal hernia. And this is one that if we gave you symptoms, they look exactly the same. The only thing that the, it's different between them is GERD, the problem is in the lower esophageal sphincter or the LES, whereas in hiatal hernia, the problem is in a weak diaphragm. You have a weak or a, uh, what do you call it, um, a more open LES in GERD, where um, in hiatal hernia, the problem is the diaphragm. So the fix for GERD is gonna repair the LES or change the lifestyle, diet, et cetera. And the fix for hiatal hernia is gonna to be to repair the diaphragm. And they also can make lifestyle changes. So you kind of see there's really the only difference between these two is where the problem is located. And then the fix is going to be to fix where that problem is located. So now let's talk about the difference between gastritis, peptic ulcer disease and gastroenteritis. So starting with gastritis, this is an inflammation of the stomach. It can be acute or chronic. Um, it's usually caused by infection. Um, and you know, my overall goals are going to be to decrease acid um, with a daily um, proton pump inhibitor, or H2 receptor blocker. And if it's chronic, they're gonna need vitamin B12 replacement. Whereas when I start talking about peptic ulcer disease, I'm not just having an inflammation, there's actually ulcers forming. So it's a lot deeper effect on the tissue. Um, it's usually caused by infection or inflammation. It can also be as a result of stress. Peptic ulcer disease is commonly related to stress. There's gonna be a concern for bleeding in these patients because ulcers can bleed because they go deeper into that tissue with those ulcers um, and can lead to a lot of problems. So there could be more hemodynamic instability. And a lot of times the cue that you're gonna look for in a question is when it talks about their pains getting better or worse with meals, um, you wanna think about ulcers because usually with um, gastro, uh, gastritis and gastroenteritis, um, you know, like they're, they're having 
having like a lot of problems with appetite and stuff in general, and peptic ulcer disease, you know, if they have a duodenal ulcer, which is actually the most common, they actually feel better after they eat. So that's going to be something that's a little bit different. So remember with peptic ulcer disease, if they have a stomach ulcer, um, their pain gets worse with it when they eat. If they have a duodenal ulcer, then their pain gets better when they eat. Then there's gastroenteritis, and this is completely different. You know, the other two were kind of inflammation, ulceration. This is the stomach bug. So think like a virus. Um, and, you know, like think you go to a restaurant and you eat something, it just doesn't sit well with you. This is what gastroenteritis is. There's a lot of nausea and vomiting. And the one thing that's different is gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. You can't give that to me. Um, whereas, uh, what do you call it, um, gastroenteritis, if I'm around someone who has like a stomach bug, I can totally get it. Um, so I want to be worried about my fluid and electrolytes because um, more commonly with gastroenteritis, they can have a lot of nausea and vomiting. Peptic ulcer disease, they can have bleeding, which can cause them to um, have nausea and vomiting and gastritis might have some nausea, but usually gastroenteritis, think stomach bug, you're just like puking everything up because there's this infection going on, can't keep anything down. So let's talk about cholecystitis versus cholelithiasis. So the difference here is an inflammation versus a um, obstruction. <clears throat> so in cholecystitis is inflammation and infection of the gallbladder. They may complain of uh, pain, fever, chills, jaundice, um, nausea, vomiting, their white blood cell count can be up because there's an infection present. So focus on managing the infection by giving antibiotics and managing the problem by removing the gallbladder. Um, whereas cholelithiasis thinks severe pain is the main problem. They have what's called biliary, uh, biliary colic, I could talk. Um, and so we're really worried about obstruction. So we're gonna give medications that are going to help to break down stones that are called bile acids. We're gonna do shockwave therapy. Think back to like kidney stones, but we're going to break down the stones in the gallbladder. And then also possibly an ERP, uh, ERCP or stent, which is a procedure where you go in to open up um, where there's blocked ducts and also open up um, those areas with a stent to allow for those um, uh, stones to pass so that that blockage is gone. So um, kind of looking at some of those differences there in the symptoms that they're going to have, their treatments, and then really well, what are we focused on? What's really the problem here? So anorexia versus bulimia. So these, uh, both these people have a obsession with weight loss and managing their weight. Um, with anorexia, it uh, comes from a very um, restrictive, uh, usually um, I shouldn't say it comes from it. Um, it's very um, uh, common that they have very restrictive patterns, like just straight up restricting. Now, um, most of these patients with anorexia are going to be underweight. Um, and you know, the problem we're going to be worried about is they can be severely malnourished and have those fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Whereas with bulimia, they actually can have a normal weight. So sometimes it's harder to see because with anorexia, it's very obvious that they're uh, malnourished, not, you know, meeting their needs. But with bulimia, um, you know, it can, the person can be a normal weight. They, um, eat and then follow by restrictive measures, whether it's vomiting, um, diet pills, diet diuretics, laxatives, over-exercise. There's a lot of different things they can do. Um, but the thing that it's going to really like when you're seeing in a test questions where you're like, oh, what's, which one is it? Look for dental and mouth complications from vomiting. Remember, they can have those macerated knuckles. They can have um, teeth complications. They can have, um, you know, acid base imbalances, that metabolic alkalosis from vomiting all that acid. Um, and then also the same thing, the malnourished and uh, fluid balances as well. And last but not least, there's diverticulosis versus diverticulitis. So diverticulosis is where there's outpouchings in the intestines. And this is where you know, you've had too much pressure in your abdomen, you form these outpouches, but they don't actually hurt anything unless they become inflamed. It's not that it's good to have them and that's okay because obviously you're pretty much setting yourself up to have something that can get inflamed, but usually they don't cause any problems. Probably uh, almost everyone watching this video has at least one diverticula in them um, or knows someone who does at least. Um, and so we really want to make diet changes for these patients. Increasing fiber really helps. Whereas with diverticulitis, it's an inflamed diverticula. And if you, um, in a test question, you might see something along the lines. So I'm not, if you think what I'm saying in a test question that I'm telling you what actually is on our test, I'm not, but I'm just, I should say more in an NCLEX like question, like questions that I've seen before, um, they might talk about a left lower quadrant mass. That's one of the key signs of diverticulitis. 
So this is where those out pouchings become inflamed. And um, what do you call it? When they become inflamed, you know, there's that whole concern for too much pressure, which can lead to perforation and peritonitis. Um, and so for them, it's going to be very different. So for the other patient, diverticulosis, I want to make diet changes, increase their fiber, get things moving. Whereas with diverticulitis, I do not want anything moving. I want lots and lots and lots of bowel rest. And when I say bowel rest, I'm not saying bed rest necessarily, but bowel rest. I want their bowels to not be doing anything. So NPO, nothing by mouth, no bowel stimulation. I'm not sticking anything in them to get their, their bowels squeezing and moving. Because any sort of pressure in their bowels or increased abdominal pressure could lead them to perforate and then get peritonitis. Da, da, da. I want to support fluid and electrolyte imbalances for these patients and manage infection. Um, I'm going to be giving them IV fluids and antibiotics usually to manage that diverticulitis. Sometimes it can be managed at home, but most of the time it's managed in the hospital with IV fluids, MPO, sometimes an NG tube, um, and just letting their bowel rest so that they can get back to doing whatever it is they were doing. And then they'll just be treated like the patient for diverticulosis where we just want them to increase their fiber. So kind of think of this like exacerbations and remissions. You can have diverticulosis and hit like flare ups of diverticulitis or you could have diverticulosis your whole life and never get inflamed. You might get lucky, but um, keep in mind diverticulosis, get things moving, diverticulitis, no movement. I do not want the, the bowels being stimulated at all. So yeah, so I hope that these um, little differentiations help to break things down for you and make more sense. I'll see you for the next one.